reading from the Acts of the Apostles. There broke out a severe persecution of the church in Jerusalem, and all were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made a loud lament over him. Saul, meanwhile, was trying to destroy the church, entering house after house and dragging out men and women. He handed them over for imprisonment. Now those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Thus Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Christ to them. With one accord, the crowds paid attention to what was said by Philip. When they heard it, they saw the signs he was doing. For unclean spirits, crying out in a loud voice, came out of many possessed people, and many paralyzed and crippled people were cured. There was great joy in that city. Verbum Domini. Let all the earth cry out to God with joy. Shout joyfully to God all the earth. Sing praise to the glory of his name. Proclaim his glorious praise. Say to God, how tremendous are your deeds. Let all on earth worship and sing praise to you. Sing praise to your name. Come and see the works of God his tremendous deeds among the children of Adam. He has changed the sea into dry land. Through the river they passed on foot. Therefore, let us rejoice in him. He rules by his might forever. Dominus Pobiscum. Lectius Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem. Jesus said to the crowds, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. But I told you that although you have seen me, you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me, because I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, 
but that I should raise it on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. And I shall raise him on the last day. Verbum Domini. I remember quite some years ago that a convert to Catholicism was learning about our lectionary system and that we have a year of Matthew, a year of Mark, and a year of Luke. And he said, but my favorite gospel is John. Where's that? I said, well, that's what we do in Lent and in Eastertide. And we take this gospel of John in small bite-sized chunks because there's so much here. And we do so in order to gain the balance of understanding the richness of this gospel of John. Today's gospel is a continuation of our Lord's teaching right after he multiplied loaves and fish and then walked on the water. And in, in that walking on the water, for the first time in the gospel, when the apostles see him in great terror, he says, fear not, I am. This is his proclamation of his divinity for the first time to them. Remember that in Exodus chapter 3, that the Lord had spoken to Moses in the flaming bush. And in that fire speaks out when Moses complains, I don't know who you are. He says, tell the people of Israel, I am. I am has sent you. And this is what Christ takes on as his own name. And it'll be something that St. Paul has to learn soon after. As a matter of fact, in a couple of days, we'll hear about his conversion when over time, the people of Israel have so much respect for the holy name of God. They won't say it. In fact, it came to be a custom that only the high priest was allowed to pronounce the name six times on the feast of Yom Kippur. That was it. Six times in the prayers of Yom Kippur, he could pronounce the sacred name. Nobody else could. Why not? They were concerned to keep the second commandment that you do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain to make sure that they never abrogated that commandment. They wouldn't even speak the name and instead they would say Lord in their presence. Still to this day, that is their practice. They'll call him Lord, Adonai, only in prayers. And if they're not even praying, but just referring to God, they'll simply call him Hashem, the name. That's how important this name is. And this gets at his very essence. Now, Christ has called himself I am, as he does what only God does 
throughout the Old Testament. The only one who ever walks on water in the Old Testament is the Lord God. It's mentioned in Job 9, a couple of the Psalms, and a couple times in Isaiah. So it's very rare that anybody walks on water, but the only one who does is the Lord God. So when Christ is walking on water and says, I am, he's claiming to be God. Most clearly, most definitely. And now he's further defining that. And a number of times throughout this gospel, our Lord will talk about himself as I am with certain predicates. I am the light of the world three times. I am the resurrection and the life. Twice he says, I am the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Here, is, and again, we have to keep all of that in context. Keep that in balance here to understand what he's saying about himself. Now he's saying, I am the bread of life. Christ is identifying himself as the one who will be nourishing people, not with some things, but with himself. This is key because we humans constantly switch our direction and our attention over to being nourished by various other things. Of course, we like good food, and some cultures are better at it than others. Italians over the Irish. I like the Irish, great folks, but the Italians are better cooks. And a lot of other groups, the Greeks, great cooks. And it's easy to turn your attention to that. But it's not what Christ is speaking of. There's another kind of nourishment because um, as one sign at an Italian restaurant back in Chicago said, the problem with Italian food, three or four days later, you're hungry again. Even there, you can be hungry again. Christ gives another kind of promise about himself. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Now notice how those are put together, and they're meant to be parallel. It's not meant to be two opposing things. It's meant to be something as typical of the way that Israelite literature reads, that you repeat something slightly differently as a way to emphasize it. So believing in Jesus and coming to him are two aspects of the same reality. When you come to Christ, you come to him with faith. And the temptation sometimes shows up when Christians of differing traditions begin to say, well, you know, receiving faith is what you should be focused on and not on the Eucharist. What a false kind of dichotomy. You don't dichotomize that. Yes, you come to Jesus in faith, and he emphasizes teaching on faith. When the crowd, just we heard in the gospel a couple days ago, when they say, what must we do to do the works of God? You must believe in the Son of Man. Then they ask for signs. But that is something that he requires. But he also requires that we eat his body and drink his blood. It's not either or. And to set up those kinds of dichotomies are false. We don't just come and say, well, I already received the Eucharist. No, you have to grow in faith as well. You don't just have faith. You come to receive the body and blood of Christ. And this promise that our Lord gives 
I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Think about the dichotomy here with Sirach, chapter 24, verse 21. In that passage, wisdom describes herself as food because in Hebrew, they typically personify wisdom as a woman because the word for wisdom, chokhmah, is a feminine noun. Plus, <clears throat> in those days, all the students at the schools were boys, and you're fairly likely to get boys' attention if you start talking about girls. So that was one of the things going on, describing her as beautiful and describing her as having delicious sweets like honey and wonderful food. Boys are also interested in lots of food. They're always hungry, as I recall. And wisdom says there that those who eat of wisdom will hunger for more. And those who taste of my drink will thirst for more. There's something there that wisdom speaks about this gaining of understanding and knowledge, which, by the way, is a gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us wisdom, something that human beings are in great lack today. There's not a lot of wisdom, and people should seek more wisdom more understanding. There's a big difference between knowing things, knowledge is good, knowing lots of things is good, but wisdom is knowing how to use the knowledge and when to use it, when to be silent, when to speak, when to act, when to refrain. That's wisdom. You can read more of the wisdom books like even Ecclesiastes as well as Ecclesiasticus. And wisdom says that if you taste of that good gift of wisdom, you'll want more. You'll still be hungry, and you will still be thirsty. Christ brings out this other approach. He said, whoever comes to me will never hunger. Uh, well, and again, let me just correct the translation slightly. It says, will not hunger forever. Hebrew doesn't have the word never. So you have to be careful when you read this. They don't have the word never. It's not forever will you hunger. And whoever believes in me will not thirst forever. He speaks of himself as the source of ultimate satisfaction for the desires we have. We human beings have desires to go beyond ourselves. There's something built into us. In fact, I know you ladies sometimes get frustrated with us men when we don't stop and ask for directions. But one of the reasons we don't is we kind of like getting lost because it's an adventure, and we like adventures. Hopefully we'll get out of it. We trust that we will. It's still America. It's not wilderness, so it's OK. You'll find a road. But we like that. And it's part of what drives explorers. It's one of the reasons why I really love the space program. We should go beyond ourselves and seek things beyond what we know, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We even explored the Arctic and the Antarctic, so let's go to space. Let's see beyond ourselves. But even when you find the top of the world or the bottom of the world, when you go beyond the world, when you go to another planet, you will still be empty and hungering for more 
And those things will never, ever satisfy, no matter how far you go, no matter what you discover, it will never satisfy. Christ speaks of himself as the infinite one. This is why it's so important to accept in faith that he is I am. He is God the Son and that his Father has sent him to us so that we would seek the infinite one. There will be no limits to somebody who is infinite. There will be no limits to the mystery of who Christ is. There will be no end with him. And that's why we won't have to try to find some other horizon, some other planet, some other continent or anything. In Christ, we will find that infinite goal as well as that infinite source of life. He will be the one that gives us eternal life, and he will be the one that intrigues us in eternal life in a way that no creature can. And so, in this gospel, we turn to Christ, the bread of life, with faith and approaching him with trust that he will be that ultimate satisfaction. All these other goods in life are wonderful things, but our Lord will be the one who satisfies ultimately. And this is what we set our hearts on in faith.